I guess it pays to be ready, right? Because if you're ready, you don't have to get ready. Do you not know that in Corinthians, it talks about the fact that God gave us all a gift. If you have not realized your gift from him, everyone has one. Once you have become saved by accepting him, little teaching here, and I know you already know this, love land. God has given you a gift. Now, I explained to the choir on Wednesday, yeah, you see me up and down this piano on keyboards. You see my fellas back here. These are talents. God has given us the gift, but these are just our reasonable service. Mama started me at age of three, so I had to do this, but this is just a talent. This is not my gift, okay? My gift is given to me by God in the gift of administrations. I use that in the secular world. I use that here at church. I even use it at home. Hello, praise the Lord. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, everyone has a gift. God has invested a gift in all of you and us. I pray, if you haven't realized your gift, that you would pray that God would reveal it unto you. I guarantee you, the word is true. Somebody say the word is true. The word is true. Somebody say the word is true. The word is true. Now. The gift that looks good on you. The gift that looks good on you. The gift that looks good on you.
Amen, amen. Your gift looks good on you. You wear it well. Amen. Along with a little grace, a little love, and there's the covering of the anointing, your gift looks good on you. We all have gifts, but everybody's gift don't look good on them. Amen. Amen. At this time, we want to welcome some very special people. If today is the day that God has blessed you to worship with us this morning for the very first time, could you please stand so we can acknowledge you? If this is your first Loveland worship service, amen, amen, welcome, welcome. Our greeting committee, could you please stay standing? The greeting committee is coming around with a gift for you. And that gift is an envelope. Fill that envelope out and let that be your offering to us today. Amen. Loveland Church is a church on a mission. And because Jesus is Lord, the mission of Loveland Church is to worship, evangelize, disciple, serve, and fellowship, maximizing our lives triumphantly in order to reach the world. Amen. On behalf of our senior pastor and his wife, Charlene, we just want to welcome you to Loveland this morning. And we just want to welcome Loveland members to another worship service. And man, at this time, could we please stand and welcome our visitors and welcome each other.
we're talking about a gift this morning. And we have been gifted as well. The choir went down, but they didn't go down early. They know what they're doing. We would like to present to you all, and I remember this young lady, and many of you do, as a youngster, as, a, as we would say, a young tyke. And she has been found, she has the foundation of our Christian belief because of her father there, Mr. Greg Coleman, and her mother, Sister Maria Coleman. Sister Stan, Sister Maria. I know, you're shy and all, but that's all good. <laughs> Gotta give some credit where it's due here. She has her Christian foundation because of her parents, like many of us. And, and brothers and sisters who are just getting married, those you guys little kids, you guys, I admonish you to do the same thing with your children. Like we were brought up, bring your children up the same way. That way, I have never heard of any problems with Sister Whitney Coleman. So brothers and sisters, would you please receive Whitney Coleman and her gift. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Now I know he's going to be mad about this, but yesterday was my dad's birthday. So happy birthday, dad. Um, it's been a special blessing. I've been gone for about eight years just in school and um, just being back has just been awesome. Not only just receiving the word, but just being back with my church family. Um, but it's been a special blessing to be able to, to worship and to minister with my dad. It has to be a very special experience. So thanks, Dad, for practicing with me. <laughs> and I love you. All right, let's try to do this. Chasing after you, God. I said I'm done. 
Please lay me at the throne Just leave me there alone To gaze upon your glory To you I sing the song Please take me to the King I don't have much to bring And my heart is torn this morning some of us we haven't even reached our breakthrough because we haven't given it all to God this morning some of us are at the verge of being able to accept all the things that God wants to bless us with but we haven't given it all to God this morning how many of you guys want to give it to all to God this morning every little thing every big thing every single thing come on It's all for you, this is all for you, Lord, it's all for you, this is all for you, God, it's all for you, this is all for you, Lord, it's all for you. Can y'all say that with me? This is all for you. This is all for you. Can y'all say that with me? Just say it. Here we go. This is all for you, this is all for you. This is all for you, this is all for you. This is all for you, this is all for you. This is all for you, this is all for you. Give you all I have, give you all I have. This is all I have, this is all for you. No one is above you. Take all of me, take what you need. This is all for you, God, it's all for you. This is all of me. This is all for you
much to bring and my heart is torn in pieces but it's my offering please lay me at the throne just leave me there alone to gaze upon your glory to you I sing the song please take Another big hand clap. Praise God. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Right up there. Praise God. So you, your tradition is you want to put it right in the middle, don't you? Over here. Right over there. Praise God. Whitley, thank you so much. Amen. Wow. Let's open our Bibles and thank you so much to our band this morning. Let's give, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise for these great men of God who lead us in in worship every Sunday morning, just about every Sunday morning. Amen. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles on this morning to the 16th chapter of Matthew. We're, we're just about finished with the 16th chapter of Matthew. Brother Cook said, don't rush. All right, we'll take another six months. <laughs> it really is quite possibly one of the hardest to digest passages in Scripture. When the Lord Jesus says these very challenging things, we don't want that nowadays. You know, we want to hear how to make it. The five steps to success. Three tips on how to be a millionaire. And some of that is in here. It's in the Word. It's in the Word. But we prefer that. But then... Here comes Jesus saying things like this. If anyone desires to come after me, <laughs> let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall gain his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall gain it. But, but watch how it begins to turn because there's a blessing in there. If you can get past that uh, bitter taste, there's a real blessing. The greatest blessing is contained in there. L let me read it to you. We'll begin at verse 24 for the sake of context. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For who do it, who so, whoever desires to save his life, trust me, King James, I want to say be and thou, but we will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, the Son of Man, watch, will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. Watch, watch, because it begins to take a strange kind of change Verse 28 says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming. Kingdom. Father, we ask you to bless your word and our time together in it. We pray, Spirit of God, that you will speak to our hearts, teach us. We wait. We listen. We trust you. And we love your word. We love your word. Thank you for your word. In Jesus, everybody said together, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. What a astounding turn. Did you notice how verse 28 said something kind of strange? It said, there's some standing right here. They won't taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom and his glory. And uh, that's, a, that's a statement that has been debated for 2,000 years. People have had challenging moments. Skeptics and atheists have said, see there, Jesus said, I'm coming right back. And he didn't. Um, and, uh, and others have said, well, maybe he didn't know. Which then, of course, would mean he's not divine. Not, he's not God. We're going to look at that because in there, right after talking about denying yourself in there is the jewel in the midst of the stone in there is the silver lining of that cloudy moment wrapped up in there is all of the great things that uh, folks really want. You know, remember I just talked about that? Five steps to being a millionaire. Three steps to life success. It's wrapped up right in there. If, if we can get past that, deny himself, lose his life, gain it. It's in there. But uh, we, we get so scared when he starts telling us stuff like deny yourself. Don't try to gain, lose. And we get so scared when he says that. There are great people who've done great things and many of those great things that have been done over the centuries have been done because they discovered who they are. And uh, which tells us pretty clearly that the key to success is not activity. Because if you try to do what I do, you're going to mess up. Because I'm not you. You got to be you. And uh, you can be the best you that anybody can be because you're you and there ain't no you like you you're the best you that God ever made there's no you 
like you. Would you look at somebody and tell them that, please? Look at someone and tell them there's no you like you. And uh, it really doesn't matter how old you are because you are exactly the age God wanted you to be be right now doesn't really matter what gender you are because you're exactly as feminine as God made you to be or as manly as God designed you to be well let me change that verb and let's let's put it this way as God imagined you to be did you know that you are a product of God imagination. Wow. Wow. And really, you're going to see this through scripture that the key to this thing and the key to success um, in life, uh, it, you know, after we spend all this time on deny yourself and, and all of that, uh, you know, and it's not about you and you, 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 you know, you might get the impression that you ought to become a hermit or a monk. This is part of where that whole idea in the church for years was that uh, women ought to look as bad as they possibly can if you save. <laughs> well, they didn't put it like that, you know. They put another, you know, lipstick. The de devil wear lipstick. Jezebel in the Bible had on lipstick. Uh, so, you know, and, and uh, so, so that idea that there was something wrong with, with painting the house if it needed painting. <laughs> Come on now, if the barn needs some painting, paint the thing, you know. Make the world a better place. <laughs> Help us to enjoy your presence. That women ought to look as bad as they can, and, uh, and men ought to smell as bad as they can. Right? That, that was, and we, of course, we didn't say it quite that way. You know, it was another kind of way. Well, I'm a man. Um, and, you know, your hands got to be rough, and you, you know, all that kind of stuff. You got to be, you know, funky to be a man. It just was necessary. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was, of course, not very pleasant, especially in the church. Um, you know, I was just talking to some folks last week who don't remember. Anybody remember when, when uh, the tradition was a once a week bath? Y'all remember that? Saturday night. Come on, talk back to me. Saturday night wasn't it cooked? Right before church. <laughs> and speaking of right before, see, because those traditions, we wonder where stuff comes from. Uh, you know, we worship on Sunday morning. You guys, bold enough, get up and come at a 7.30 service. The tradition has been 11 o'clock. That, that, was, that was because of the Western world being farm-oriented. And farmers would get up and do their farming first thing in the morning, get to church. By 11, the Bible doesn't say 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, I'm, I'm saying that to set you up because he like, the other day I was talking to a couple, beautiful couple, just beautiful. Um, they get ready to get married. So, they said, well, you know, we may want to do it in June. Said, Pastor, why do, why do uh, weddings tend to happen in June? Well, you know where that tradition came from? All right, let me, let me explain. Let me explain. How many of y'all want to explain? Oh, never mind. That, that don't matter. Don't matter. Whether you want it or not, I'm going to explain. That, uh, that there was a tradition uh, right along that whole issue of bath on Saturday night. Well, before it became a once-a-week bath, it was <clears throat> a once-a-year bath. Now, I got... You don't remember that one? <laughs> Kelly, he's a perfect, he's a perfect front man. He helped me out. 
There, there was once a tradition of a once a year bath. Now, you know, and, and uh, that was because it was a Western thing, mostly in Europe. And uh, the way it happened was that uh, it was cold during the winter. So guess when the bath was? The spring, somewhere around May. And, uh, well, you know, I told you about that funky, I mean, stinky <laughs> man. Daddy had to get the first bath. So he took the first bath, and mama, and same water. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and then all the children, and then, watch, and then you save the baby to last. Yeah. And by that time, by the time baby got his bath, the water was so dirty, they came up with this little statement. Don't throw the baby out. <laughs> That's where it came from. That's where it came from. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. So, because uh, to make sure you got him out of there, you know, that water was so dark by then, you didn't know what was in there. I saw, I saw something heavy. What was that? <laughs> um, so in the spring, the bath would take place. That way, sometime around May, the bride would get her annual bath. And um, yeah, then they could have the wedding in June. A month later. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but, uh, now why was I telling you all that? I, I didn't forget. Well, the whole idea, the whole idea behind it, watch, because when you're, when you're looking at God's word, did, did I lose you? Did you lose me somewhere? All right. Y'all get me back. Can. Um, that, uh, that really when you imagine yourself, when you think about yourself, you, you, you don't mind making little improvement, right? Like a bath every now and then. And, uh, you know, you praying for that husband, honey, uh, say amen with a little perfume behind the ear. You know? <laughs> Say amen with that. Father, let me have him. <laughs> you know, that, that brother, he hears, he hears it when God speaks in answer to that prayer. He, he, but he also smells that perfume. So, amen. Help the Lord. Well, never mind. Let me move on a little bit. Watch, watch the punch, the power of this passage in Matthew 16. When the Lord Jesus says... There's some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Now, when he says this here in Matthew 16, 28, he says the same thing is recorded by Luke in Luke chapter 9. I think verse 28 as well. And Mark, in Mark chapter 9. And, uh, and, and watch the strange thing to help the skeptics and those who want, I, what was Jesus saying? The world is going to end and some are going to still be here that are standing there then? That's not what he was saying. Funny thing about chapter 16 is it comes right before chapter 17. Isn't that amazing? And I'm going to tell you something really, really, really deep about the Bible. Anytime you see a chapter 17, right before it, chapter 16. Uh, and uh, so what happens in chapter 17? Here's what happens in chapter 17. There is a marvelous thing happen that we call the transfiguration. Same thing happens in Luke 9. Same thing happens in Mark 9. What's the transfiguration? 
That's when Jesus, taking a couple of his disciples, goes up to what we now call the Mount of Transfiguration, and there on the mountain, he is transformed right before their eyes. And when they look up and see him, he now is dressed in splendiferous clothing. His clothes are as bright. The, the book says brighter than the sun. Mark records it this way, that uh, his clothes were brighter than any man could bleach them. And that his face shone brighter than the sun. Beside him were Elijah and Moses. I mean, just a beautiful. Listen, there's something here. There's something here. Why then? Why, right after he says, deny yourself. Lose yourself. Your goals, your plans, throw them out. Follow me. Why? Then, does he go straight into this marvelous, brilliant transfiguration? Because here's what you get in exchange for your goals, your life, your agenda, the glory of God. Man. And listen, it's more than a notion. And the reason why I challenge you at the beginning to, to just think and reimagine yourself is because most people, most Christians, don't realize this. And therefore, they don't live it out. The reason why during this uh, month when there's a special emphasis on uh, African American history, you have, you have uh, go down the list. Go down the list. You've got these heroes and heroines. You've got people like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, uh, Martin Luther King, who not only did great works, but they did, they did their great works in the name of Jesus. Amen. Should I take this thing off? All right. My battery low. All right. See if I can do it this way. I do? All right. I need two long arms. Y'all didn't, didn't know my... Okay. Uh, but the reason why is, is real simple. Uh, because they discovered who they are in Christ and lived it out. And lived it out. I mean, that, and that's the key to the whole thing. That's the key to the whole thing. Instead of doing your thing, it's doing God's thing. And uh, li listen, every, every last one that I just named, for example, and there are many others that I won't, uh, lived what you and I might call sacrificial lives. But they weren't the only ones. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker, a uh, 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 millionaire, but fulfilling what she believed God had called her to. John Johnson, same way, um, with uh, Johnson Publishing Company, believing that he was fulfilling what God had called him to do. So uh, on the one hand, it might appear that you can't have anything, uh, you, won't, you won't enjoy anything, uh, on the other hand, it is, you will, but it's secondary to being. Having is secondary to being. In fact, it might be tertiary, uh, that is third. Uh, being first, doing second, and then having third. So let me show you three things here this morning to just kind of illustrate our point. Uh, the, the first challenge, listen, here's God's great challenge. 
And if you think about it, it makes good Bible sense to say that God's big challenge is getting, number one, getting the glory in you. Getting the glory in you. I mean, that's the big challenge. Because, see, if, if he's going to manifest it out of you, he's got to get it in you. Isn't that, doesn't that make sense? Uh, that uh, j- the purpose of Christ on the cross is not just to give us fire insurance. That you get to go to heaven when you die. That's big and that's very, very important. But it's not all. It's not all. Um, that uh, God, his goal, his purpose is firstly to manifest himself to the world. He does that through you. Let me give you an example of it. Turn your Bibles, uh, if you would, please, to... uh, Well, let's start with verse 27 of Matthew 16. Someone with a good, strong preaching voice, I want you to read verse 27 of Matthew 16. How does it read, Pastor? Some man shall come in the glory of his father and with his angels, and then he will reward every man according to his work. Okay, so he he says he's going to come, and when he does, he's going to reward every man according to his works. I want you to read another passage scripture. If you'll open your Bibles to Colossians, 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 just keep going to your right. If you see Philippians, go right one more. If you see Revelation, (laughs) never mind, we'll read it to you. Uh, You got Colossians? Who's got Colossians chapter one? And let's start with verse number 25. Someone read there, beginning with verse 25. All right. Don't stop. Stay up there, sir. To fulfill the word of God, I'm, I'm being given this ministry. 26 says what? Even the ministry which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Hold on just a second right there. He said, now look, there is something that God is doing that's been hidden And I believe the term was generations. It really could say for thousands of years. Uh, But but keep going, Pastor. What's it say then? To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory. Wait a minute. What is the riches of what? The riches of his glory. The riches of his glory. So, watch. Here's Here's what he just told us. He said... There is something that's been hidden for generations, for thousands of years, that is now, and this now, 2,000 years ago, now it is being manifested, I'm preaching it, and it is, he's saying, to his glory. Keep going, Pastor. One more time on that last phrase. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, known known among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. Okay. Did did anybody get that? Okay. So here's what he just told me. He said, look, here's what God is doing. Let me say that again. Here's what God is up to. Here's what God's agenda is. Making known the mysteries that have been hidden for thousands of years. And how's it manifested? One simple phrase. Christ in you. 
And then what does he call it? The hope of glory. So the great hope of manifesting God's glory is in you. Wow. I mean, turn to somebody, please. Just turn them and tell them, that's you. Tell them, that's, that's you. That's you. That's you. God, God, his agenda is to manifest his glory in you. How? Through Christ. So, listen, bottom line, and, and glory, I mean, just such a beautiful word, but to really make sure we get the fullness of it, to really make sure we see exactly what he's saying, uh, you go back again to Matthew 17. And you see the Mount of Transfiguration. You see Jesus, splendid, brilliant, bright, mystifying in his beauty. That's the glory of God. Comma, that he wants to see in you. Wow. See, and I, you know, we can take this so much deeper. In fact, I will in a moment in the last few minutes of this message, but the point of the matter is, is real simple, that uh, the glory of God is the agenda of God. The glory of God is in you. And that you, your children, your wife, uh, husband, you, you are to reflect the magnificent glory of God. This is why, and I, I didn't preach last Sunday, did I? Uh, at this service, but last Sunday at the second two services I talked about this great tragedy that is plaguing the Inland Empire. It, it's plaguing the United States of America, but it is especially um, ground zero is the Inland Empire. And, and that's the problem of, of teen sex slavery taking our girls, 13, 14, 15, and chaining them in the worst kind of way. Not with, uh, not with uh, chains from Ace Hardware, but with chains that plague the mind. And that young lady, Abriana Parks, who was found on that yard in Yorba Linda two weeks ago, Case number one. I mean, a demonstration. Well, so what, what happened? What happened? What happened? What, what happened? What happened? And what is happening is that, that these young girls looking for love, acceptance, appreciation are being psychologically, deliberately psychologically. I'm not talking about just some little game the guy, I'm talking about these guys plan this out, study it to learn how to hook and crook and twist these young girls to make money, make money, get money, get money and, uh, and transport them across county lines in order to avoid police detection sometimes across state lines, and many times across the border for money's sake. So, you know, March 29th, um, we're going to have a session here to deal with this and talk about, hope you can come, be a part of that. Uh, Noelle, are you in here right now? Noelle, she's up in the balcony, but Noelle is, is Noelle Wiggins helping to lead the charge on that. But what, what's going on with that? Here's what's going on. Here's the idea behind it. Uh, that 
while God says, I want you to reflect my glory, the enemy, Satan, wants you or her or anyone else to reflect anything but God's glory. So that here's a girl who is flattered to be called whole. Simply because you're my hope. I mean, come on, can you get a little closer? I know this is church and I ain't supposed to say that. But, but I want us to see the very depth of, of what goes on in our hearts and in our heads because this is the quest of man. This is the desire to, to really know who I am. And the enemy will accept you if you'll be less than Well, God will save you to make you greater than. Listen to it. We'll break it down this way. See, the, the real quest, first step, getting the glory in. And then, of course, the second is once it's in, it's a matter of letting the glory out. Uh, we, we see right there in that passage that Pastor Bubba just read a moment ago in Colossians chapter 1 that that's really the, Paul said that's really the thing. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me show you the third and final point of this message. Uh, we not only want to get the glory in, let the glory out, we want to set the glory up. And uh, here's a passage that uh, really talks about it. It's in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And uh, my Lord, I, I think for the sake of time, I'll have to uh, deal with uh, just the one verse. But turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and look there at verse number, yeah, 18. I'm trying to stay there. But uh, these others keep running across my, these other passages. And as I look at them, I'm tempted and uh, all right, let's back up a little bit just to get the context. Um, look at verse number 15. Let's look at verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning with verse 15. Is that back far enough? All right. No, let's go to verse 12. We'll be at Genesis chapter 1 in a minute. All right. <laughs> Look at verse 12. Let's start there at verse 12. I'm, I'm going to read this fast, so you got to listen fast. Listen, therefore, and of course, whenever we see therefore, we want to know what it's there for. So, but I ain't going back. Therefore, since we have such hope, we have such hope, we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Now, now stay, stay close to him now. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily, at the end of what was passing away, meaning the Old Testament, the law that was passing away, and he had been up on the mountaintop, the glory of God shone on his face, and he comes down off the mountain, the glory was so bright on his face, visibly, that they couldn't look on it, so he did what? He veiled his face. Uh, they couldn't look at it. But look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Meaning, in other words, there are many people, and he, in this particular case, we're talking about the Jews, that could not understand the Old Testament. Listen, Jesus said this himself, that uh, you search the scriptures because you think in them you find life, and these are they which speak of me. What did he just say? The Old Testament is about Jesus. It is. And if you read it and you don't see Jesus, you need to go back and read it again. It's there all the way through the Old Testament. And listen, there's 437 prophecies that talk about his coming. But that's not the only thing I'm talking about here. I'm talking about his shadow demonstrated in the Old Testament. The cross 
demonstrated in the Old Testament over and over again, whether the sacrificial lambs of Leviticus or the blood of the sacrifice or the Passover, which led to what we now call Easter and communion that those matters that uh, in the Old Testament all point toward Jesus. Now, he says it's, it's unclear to many because it's like there's a veil over their face. But keep going. Look at this now. Uh, verse 14. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in reading the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. And so what persons do is reject Christ. It's not the Bible they don't understand. It is Jesus they don't understand. Keep reading. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, isn't that something? The veil is taken away. God, give me another hour. No, I don't have any. But if I had another hour, I'd talk to you about how people try to change people's minds politically on this or that or, or uh, socially on that or the other, sexually. Uh, you know, you ought not do this and homosexuality this and that and the other. And you know, it's, you get a person saved, you ain't got to give them all the rules. I wish I had. See, the, I told the Lord, give me another hour and he gave it to me right there in 30 seconds. I mean, it begin, everything begins to fall into place at the point of salvation. My Lord, I can illustrate that a hundred ways. But look at the rest of this now. Uh, the word says, uh, what verse was I on? 17. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is. I meant to take that mic away when I said, but where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, freedom, emancipation. And then verse 18, but we all, say now, remember the veiled face? With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, watch our being transformed into the same image. I got to stop. Just watch this now. Because here's what he just told me. He said, as I look into the mirror, I'm being transformed. You know what happened this morning? You got up. You know, and you looked in the mirror. And you say, I ain't going to church like this. I mean, most of us did that. Some of us, uh, most of us said, I ain't going to church like this, right? Uh, and so you begin to change stuff. You begin to change things. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. Can I get a witness anyway? That's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you for changing something. Uh, but unlike what you did this morning with that mirror, what the implication, read it again, you see it, is this, that with this mirror, you looked in and the mirror began to change you. Man, is Rosario the only one that got a shout from that? He's, stand up again, Rosario. I just, you know, he had to stand up on that one. <laughs> changes you and and note what he says not just changes you but from glory to glory so it just keeps on getting better and better it keeps on getting gooder and gooder from glory to glory and for the benefit of all, all who may wonder I do know gooder and gooder is not proper but 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 here's what he's telling me he's saying that that God begins to change me and it's done by the spirit of the Lord. So here's the key. Key is this. And just a quick review. The, the, they used to tell us in seminary that you, when you preach a sermon, you, you start off with a 
summary, and you end with a summary, and then in between is the whole thing. So, you know, in other words, you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. Then you tell them what you told them. So, let, let, me, just, let me just tell you, that first point was real simple. Getting the glory in. That, that's the quest. That's the quest of God. Getting the glory in you. And how is it done? By the Spirit of the Lord. So, a believer who walks around believing, but not filled with the Spirit, is disobeying. Because it's not a matter of you getting your belief straight and then doing everything straight and narrow. That's religion. What it, what it is, is believing straight by that being filled with his spirit, which is a part of the message of the gospel, being transformed by the spirit of the Lord. See, when Jesus made this great promise, he made these great promises, beginning in John chapter 14, 15, 16, uh, about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he, he summarizes the whole thing just before the day of Pentecost. And he says that, that not many days from now, you will receive the promise of the Father. The thing the Father promised. And uh, the promise had taken place in chapters 14, 15, 16 in the book of John. That's where the Father promised the coming of the Holy Spirit through the Son. And then in Acts 1 verse 4, he said, now it's getting ready to happen. In Acts chapter 2, it happened so that the glory of God was poured out into flesh. Now here's God's challenge. Now that I poured it in you, let it out. <laughs> shine! Children, shine! Shine brightly in the dark spots, in the darkest places, in the nooks and the crannies, the hardest places to shine, the most difficult situations. And when the going gets tough, shine. When the enemy gets on your trail, shine. When, when life is rough, Shine. Let your light shine. This is one of the only times in the word of God where you hear Jesus saying, I am the true vine. You hear Jesus saying, I'm the bread. And you hear him saying, I'm the light of the world. He never calls you the bread. He never calls you the vine. But he also says, you are the light of the world. Amen. <laughs> let it shine. Turn to somebody close to you and tell them, let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. We bless you. We give you glory and praise. For great is our God and greatly to be praised. Thank you for the book. Thank you for the revelation of your spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the saints of God who will let it shine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you may be here today and you don't know the Lord, but you want to get to know him. This is your moment. This is your day. God planned this from the beginning of time for you, that his glory can be manifested in you through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? I need to ask Jesus to come in so that he can shine out. And if you want to ask him into your life today, this is your moment. This is your time. I want to ask you to 
get ready to come down here to the front. There are going to be others that have made their way down here by the time you get here. Come on, down to the front. They're going to take you to another room and talk to you about your decision. Someone else, you may be here and you know the Lord already, but you've been away and backslidden. This is time to come home. Third person, you're in good standing with God. You want to join this church. Listen, if you're strong, there are things to be done here. We need you if you're strong. If you're weak, you need us. Either way, we invite you to come. Let's all stand together now. Come on. And if God has spoken to your heart, and for any one of those reasons you want to come, please come. Come on, come now. Come this on now. little light of mine. Come on, come on. I'm going to let it show. Anyone, whether in the balcony, come on down. This little I want to join church today. I want to be a part of this fellowship. I'm going to let it show. Father, for these who stand before you, we ask your blessings upon them. Give wisdom now, we pray. Is there someone else, anyone else who wants to come? Please come now. Please come now. I want to join this church. I know it's, uh, I know it's fashionable now. Not to necessarily affiliate with one church. But the Bible has something to say about that. I'm not against the idea of visiting and being a part of a fellowship here or there. I think that's a good thing. But the idea of just not affiliating, here, here's what the problem is. The Bible calls your pastors, elders, the bishops of your soul. Yep. So there's a care there's prayer that's right that's right that needs to be done and when there's a need in your life or your family we're to be there right right and then there's accountability there's accountability nothing wrong with accountability if you need to come for that those or other reasons hey, come on come now God is speaking to your heart please come now, Father, even while I'm praying, you may come. Father, we pray for these. Stand before you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray your blessings on their lives. We call it done in Jesus' name. Everybody said together. Amen. Amen. This big, tall gentleman on the hand here is Deacon Bauer. I want to ask you to follow him out. Deacon Bowser. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you a trick question right now. Did, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Did you get anything out of the music this morning? Yes. Including Young Whitley.